to welcome everybody back into our next session that will be um, starting now, session two, a use of the guide. And um, I'll hand it over to Kate Tibolt, who will um, kick us off as the um, moderator from the listening sessions. Great, thanks. So I'm Kate Tebow. I am the science lead for the National Science Foundation's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is a program operated by Battelle. So I'm bringing the perspective of a wildlife biologist to the standing committee. Um, so I'm here to present the um, next slide, please. Uh, summarize feedback for the listening session from the listening session participants on the use of the guide. Uh, with an emphasis on the use by Aya Cooks. And so I'm going to go through the key topics of discussion um, that are listed here. And I'm going to go in the order from the most frequently discussed issues to the least frequently discussed. Okay, so next slide is we're starting with the review pop process. And um, we hear these themes have, have come up repeatedly um, throughout the day. But there is a, a real concern that both Aya Cooks and principal investigators are pretty burdened by the current processes. And some of the suggestions to mitigate that burden was for the guide to potentially better define the role and the structure of the Aya Cooks, ensuring clarity in their focus on animal wel welfare and the role of the guide in their decision making. And to do that through this lens of allowing for local and collaborative solutions that are best suited to the specifics of the program under consideration. And um, consistently brought up was encouragement for IACUCs to see, seek outside expertise um, for proposals that deal with topics that are not addressed in the guide. So this is often taxa or new approaches. And so wildlife is a great example here. Next slide. So next we, the topic that was often discussed was scientific merit review with most of the participants not supporting, including this as an I responsibility, but of course do fully support that it is a clear expectation for principal investigators. It was frequently viewed as duplicative of the other peer review processes in place, such as for funding. And a concern that we heard repeatedly that if this requirement is going to be codified in the guide, then additional information would need to be added uh, to better inform the IACUC process. Next slide. Similar messages were also conveyed conveyed um, for the topics of harm benefit analysis and ethics. And these two topics proved to be very challenging for most to disentangle. So I've included them together here. And again, there were some mixed views on this, but the majority view was that these should not be topics that fall within the purview of the IACUC review. And the major concern was that basic research would be the most likely to be negatively impacted yeah. if those considerations were included and uh, a repeated call for additional training of IACUCs if they are um, going to be expected to perform ethical reviews. Next slide. And now to statistical expertise. Again, most do not support this as an IACUC responsibility um, to evaluate, given that it is again duplicative of other peer review processes. And as was raised earlier today, there's a frequent concern that expanding the required membership um, or the requirements of the membership of the IACUC would be disproportionately burdensome to smaller institutions. Finally, um, uh, la next slide, please. Post-approval monitoring was only raised in a few sessions, um, but this was identified as a topic that the guide should expand upon. Um, and in doing so, uh, recommendations were to encompass all aspects of an animal care and use program, not just the research, as well as a focus on the role of veterinarians in this monitoring, 
and strategies for fostering productive relationships with PIs. And with that, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Stacy Pritt. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Research Compliance Officer at the Texas A&M University System. In that role, I do oversee research compliance for 11 academic institutions and eight state agencies, although not all of those organizations conduct animal research. And I'm here today to talk to you about the use of the guide um, by IACUX. Next slide. So based on the session title given to me by the planning committee, as well as the suggested questions, I will be focusing my very brief talk on these three areas. Again, the, the actual literal operational use um, of the guide by IACUX, and I'm going to be U.S. specific here. Um, I'm going to talk about additional topics and clarity that could be put into the next version of the guide and advice for the committee revising the guide. Couple disclaimers. Uh, my opinions here are my own, not necessarily that of my employer. The comments that I have are based on how the current version of the guide is formatted. You're going to hear a lot more about different options for formatting the next version of the guide, in particular later today. And I could see there being changes um, to what I'm saying or believe should be included or not included in, in the in subsequent versions based on the format that's selected. In particular, I am gonna be talking about some, some pretty detailed granular areas, which depending on how the guide is next formatted, that may not be so applicable. And I also wanna thank the planning committee for the opportunity to participate in the workshop. Next slide. So first, how is the guide used? Again, this is a very operational, functional perspective. So first off, IACUX use the guide um, because it provides guidance for facility inspections, program reviews, and reports to the IO. Notice that I did not say semi-annual facility inspections or semi-annual program reviews. The current guide uh, calls for an annual um, review of the program. The semi-annual requirements are found in other regulatory agency requirements. The guide provides guidance and references for the questions that are asked within IACUC protocols. The guide justifies and informs IACUC policy development. I have some more specifics on that in the next slide. The IACUC, or excuse me, the guide serves, oh, previous slide, thank you. The, I, uh, the guide serves as training material for IACUC members and staff. Um, the guide also aids in the review of noncompliance. And when, when I was preparing this, I did ask for input from several of my colleagues across Texas and in, in the United States. And I had multiple colleagues do, uh, tell me that for them, the guide functions as a, quote, regulatory document, end quote. And these were multiple independent opinions. And I think this is particularly um, salient when you start talking about the interpretations of the guide by ALAC and NIH OLA, although I am fully aware that ALAC is not a regulatory agency. But this concept has been previously discussed um, in today's workshop. Next slide. So what are these policies that the IACUCs um, rely heavily on the guide for you know, information for development? Number one, animal housing specifications. And so this also speaks to what's, again, been previously discussed about the need to seriously take a look at the animal housing specifications, and I'm including sanitation here, that are currently included in, in the guide. Institutional collaborations, policies on facility operations and maintenance, and a policy on the use of non-pharmaceutical grade compounds, which has also been previously discussed, but I'll have a little bit more detail on that. Next slide. Okay, so this slide is the area of additional topics. The idea here is to just discuss things that are largely absent or really need expansion on 
from the current version. So if the guide is going to include a discussion about ethics and animal use and research, which we've already heard is, is a controversial topic, but if the guide were to include such discussions, or if the guide were to imply that IACOOKs should include ethics in their review research, which we, we sort of have with the harm benefit analysis, then we need an expanded discussion of ethics in the guide beyond the three R's. As published in multiple sources in the peer reviewed literature, including my own, the three R's do not provide a comprehensive ethical framework for the determination of whether or not animal research should be conducted. If the guide's going to include a section or reference on ethics, the context for the application of the ethics, such as deciding whether or not the research should be conducted or deciding how to best conduct a particular study from an ethical perspective, th those should be included. Next is the definition of animal welfare. The term animal welfare actually appears in the PDF document of the current version of the guide 126 times, but that includes a, a lot of reference documents, citations, and author bios. It's actually, it's actually referenced less than you would think within the text of the guide, but the term is not defined. Animal welfare as a term is very complex. A lot of people have a lot of different definitions for it, and there are a myriad of frameworks for the assessment of animal welfare. Because as many of the speakers today have pointed out, the guide serves as its own framework or reference for animal welfare. The authors of the next version of the guide should be very clear on what they mean by animal welfare. Otherwise, readers and regulators will put their own definition and assumptions on what animal welfare is. And those assumptions may actually vary from the intent of the guide. There's been quite a bit of discussion about the use of the guide for more uncommon laboratory animal species, there, or research species, I should say. The ag guide is briefly discussed towards the beginning of the current version of the guide about a reference for agricultural animals. And it is certainly understandable that the guide is not going to be able to include um, information about every species that could ever potentially be used in research. But especially in talking with my colleagues, it was felt that the guide, the next version of the guide could include general, more generalized concepts for how to apply the guide to more uncommon species. And then finally, even though administrators, and it's unclear as to what's that, what that specifically references in the current version, either IACUC administrators or senior level administrators within an organization. Even, even though administrators are referenced um, in the guide, there really needs to be the inclusion and acknowledgement of IACUC administrative staff, in particular credentialed IACUC administrator staff. The, the CPIA certified professional um, IACUC administrator um, Credential was started in 2007 by public responsibility in medicine and research. Since then, a total of 770 individuals have been credentialed and there are 475 with those that currently have the credential. The guide could focus on how to leverage the expertise of these credentialed professionals in um, developing, you know, further developing IACUC programs, and also too, when the new version is released, in many cases, it will actually fall on IACUC administrators to implement the guide, um, especially because that's gonna mean significant changes to IACUC policies. Next topic, excuse me, next slide. Um, additional clarity. So for this, I'm focusing on areas that are currently in the guide, but have proven to be confusing or difficult to understand or perhaps difficult to apply programmatically. So the first is the expanded emphasis on the role of the institutional official. There's one paragraph about the institutional official towards the beginning of the current version of the guide. 
But where we are with animal care and use programs, especially looking at um, the future resources needed, difficulty in hiring staff, there really needs to be an expanded discussion about the accountability that the institutional official has for programmatic oversight. Back to non-pharmaceutical grade compounds, um, there needs to be additional clarity on this topic. In particular, IACUCs find it difficult to interpret what information they need from researchers um, when they're evaluating a particular protocol. That being said, NIH OLA has created much more detailed uh, guidance, which many IACUCs use in, instead. Pilot studies have been briefly mentioned. Pilot studies are actually described very briefly twice within the current version. And I can tell you as an IACUC professional that during IACUC meetings, pilot studies, a, a great amount of discussion is given to pilot studies as a very valuable tool that IACUCs can leverage to define humane endpoints, to understand um, what exactly is going to happen with some new or novel procedures or in, in validating uh, you know, new research at a facility. And while it's wonderful that the IACU community has, has done that, that's not really captured within the current version of the guide. Prolonged restraint is, is interesting. The term prolonged restraint only appears once in the guide and it's not defined. What is given instead are examples of prolonged restraint or alternatives to prolonged restraint. What's happened in this particular instance within the IACUC community is that a lot of institutions have mirrored one another or copied one another in terms of their policies on prolonged restraint, but this is largely absent of any data on prolonged restraint, especially for the variety of species um, involved. And it, it's actually out, outside, and there's, because prolonged restraint isn't defined, it's also hard to envision the concept of, of exceptions to the guide around this. I would also offer that the emphasis on prolonged restraint really should be broadened to include more consideration of rodent species and, and rabbits. Currently the food and fluid regulation section in the guide are, are intertwined, they're approached um, together. However, those activities are typically separate in the research process and they're used for different purposes. And that becomes very confusing for IACUCs to navigate, especially when developing policy and reviewing protocols. And again, the emphasis should be broadened um, to include rodent species. And finally, the food storage requirements in the current version of the guide are out of date. This is one area that I believe should not contain specific um, set in stone standards, if you will, in terms of shelf life or storage conditions. The feed companies are, are always improving their processes and that impacts, it actually extends uh, food shelf, um, you know, the, the length of time that diets are good for. And they also have a lot of current data about storage conditions um, and which storage conditions may or, not, may or may not impact nutritional value. Um, so this is something where I think there's a lot of external information that is, is very current um, and where the guide, including very strict standards, may be counterproductive. Next slide. Stacy, just the, to give you a heads up, sorry, we're, we're running short on time. You've got about a minute and a half left. Okay, thank you. So this will be easy. A lot has been said about must, should, and may. Um, I'm not gonna repeat all of that. The only thing I'll add here is please understand that when you use, use the word exception or departure, that that can have a negative connotation. That can imply that institutions don't wanna follow the guide or are somehow falling short of guide standards. Next slide. And finally, advice for the committee, work to avoid contradictory or seemingly contradictory statements. Um, those do exist in the current version. I'm not gonna go into the exceptions component. 
Highlighting where eye cook action is needed or required would be very valuable. Currently, that's kind of spread out throughout the guide. Any new version needs to be accompanied with a reference document that describes the changes and describes any requirements. This has been done by NIH and other societies when they've released new guidance. And then finally, especially in looking at different versions of um, formatting, especially anything that could be updated frequently or um, have a short implementation period, understand that many IACOOKs have a limited ability to work within software systems that manage their protocol templates in the review process, and that any changes may take time and money for IACOOKs uh, to implement. With that, I'm done. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe, you can take it away. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Or for those of you in Europe, uh, good evening. And for the few hardy souls who are taking part from Asia, good early morning. I'm Joe Cornegy. I uh, was asked to cover the topic of the use of the guide by scientists, uh, retired from academia in 2019, most recent position was at Texas A&M. Next slide. I'm a veterinarian and also a PhD uh, scientist. I have training in both neurology and pathology, have held multiple academic positions as a tenured full professor at North Carolina State, uh, both clinical medicine and research, Missouri, mostly as an administrator, including service as dean. Last two faculty positions were focused in research, uh, UNC Chapel Hill at a medical school. I was a member of the campus-wide IACUC. And at Texas A&M, I was on the vet school faculty, but my laboratory was in an interdisciplinary facility on the main campus. My perspective, as you might imagine, is influenced in a large way by my work with the canine model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I am also the uh, current chair of the board of directors of ALAC International, although I will not be speaking for ALAC today. Next slide. The topics that I intend to discuss, I'm going to focus primarily on the low rate of translation of preclinical efficacy and adverse effects study, uh, which could argue for a need for increased rigor and validation of animal experiments and models. I'll touch on a culture of care, and then at the end, just a, a brief mention of a few other areas uh, for potential emphasis. Next slide. The problem of clinical translation, bottom line, the rate of translation is dismal by some studies less than 10%, 95% of drugs fail, mostly due to issues with efficacy, but also because of safety concerns. The schematic there on the right uh, shows this so-called valley of death. Um, in the uh, translation area, mostly at the level of phase one and phase two uh, clinical trials. And the issues relate to both internal and external validation. Internal, a study design, statistics, but also importantly, external, such as the choice of species or the underlying experimental conditions. Here, a critical one is species. And the adage, there is no perfect animal model is apropos. When you get right down to it, the human species is clearly quite different from any animal species, and that will be reflected in the results of experiments. You look at the uh, bottom uh, cartoon there, you require both good internal validity and good external validity for translation. And then finally, the last point, uh, focusing on the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, but with that said, Animals often do not predict drug toxicity nor adverse side effects. Next slide. When you turn to the low rate of uh, clinical translation, and I 
couch that in the context of today's workshop, the original statement of a task bulleted items, identified scientific merit review, harm benefit analysis, uh, rigor and producibility. And as we have heard, that is covered primarily through the guide in the role of the iCook. Stacy just uh, provided an overview of that, and we've heard further mention of the iCook. As I mentioned, I served on the iCook uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, and I think have a fairly good appreciation of the issues and challenges faced. This is from the guide where justification of the species and the number of animals proposed uh, is one of the key features. It also indicates, as I've highlighted in green, whenever possible, the number of animals, experimental group sizes should be justified. And then, as we all know from the guide, uh, the reference material is cited there as well. Next. So in the, in the context of this low rate of clinical translation, and as I've just shared, what is covered within the guide, I would argue that greater emphasis should be placed on the issue of this problematic clinical translation, and there should be a need uh, for more rigorous experimental design and data analysis. Next slide. Of course, an example of that would be the ARRIVE uh, guidelines that come from the, uh, the NC3Rs, where critical features are captured in these itemized items, such as study design, sample size, and so forth. Next slide. Turning to the issue of internal versus external validity and highlighting the distinction between the two. Internal validity, I'll speak for myself, I believe I have a fairly good feel. Uh, as examples in this one review article, a failure to take measures to prevent bias, such as random allocation to groups, blinding. Even when one corrects issues with internal validity, clinical translation has not improved. So that then makes one focus more so on external validity, uh, which can be divided into surmountable versus insurmountable issues. Surmountable, an example is given of using inbred young healthy mice uh, to potentially model a progressive disease in older humans. That can be potentially overcome. But the insurmountable issues, the principal one being species, human versus any animal model, are clearly more problematic. Next slide. Just as examples relative to the selection of species, uh, Dr. Fox mentioned this morning the issue of CRISPR not being uh, mentioned in the, the prior guide. Uh, well, as well as you might imagine, gene and cell therapy are not well covered. So in the context of uh, these advanced therapeutic options, the FDA has emphasized that it is critical to establish the biological relevance of a specific animal species to the investigational products and to also do a detailed assessment of the relevancy of each animal species used in support of a potential clinical trial. Next slide. A critical factor is predicting immunogenicity. Uh, choosing a suitable disease-specific model is of paramount importance for successful clinical translation. And here, I think as we all appreciate, the use of inbred mice has been problematic insofar as predicting uh, the potential for any uh, protein or uh, viral vector or transgene to elicit an immune response. And in that context, species-related immunogenicity could occur due to a lack of genetic diversity of the animals. Next slide. Large animals overall have been more effective in predicting adverse side effects, including um, immunogenicity. Next slide. But even with large animal models, there have been challenges. Uh, STEM-based cell therapies require the development of new protocols and test systems. And in addition, the use of more rigorous uh, large animal models. 
And there have been new immunotoxicities to both adeno-associated virus and transgene uh, in humans. And this calls for better predominantly large animal models. But even with using advanced uh, models, here I've highlighted canine uh, models of hemophilia, Duchenne dystrophy, and myotubular myopathy, there have been severe immune responses not predicted by those animal studies. Next slide. Uh, just one last comment on toxicity. Uh, uh, this clearly is something regulated by the FDA, uh, but in the context of CROs that undoubtedly utilize uh, the guide and uh, therefore are to some extent guided by the guide in conducting toxicity studies, it's important to realize that as I mentioned earlier, animals have been ineffective in predicting uh, human toxicity, which calls for alternatives to animal testing. Next. Just a few words on the culture of care. I'm sure I'm, I'm particularly uh, drawn to this topic because I've worked with a canine model for so many years where staff have been critical uh, to the uh, work that we've done. The current uh, guide does not specifically mention culture of care, but does certainly reference the principles of a culture of care. Both researchers and institutions have affirmative duties of humane care and use of research animals. It is the institution's responsibility to put into place practices to ensure the humane care and use of laboratory animals throughout the institution. Obviously, and appropriately, the emphasis is on animals. Next slide. But uh, the, the critical manuscripts, uh, papers on culture of care have gone beyond animals and emphasize the importance that staff feel empowered. Uh, it's critical that the culture of care respects and nurtures staff compassion. It's also critical that there be open communication. And then in this second publication by Robinson et al., they echo these same principles, care and welfare of staff involved in the animal care and use program and openness and transparency. And then finally, next slide. As I went through some of the materials, a few other topics that occurred to me as I looked at the current guide and then the broader um, presentation. Perhaps uh, more discussion on the overall history and the purposes uh, for using animals in research and education. Here's a table from one paper as an example. Uh, there's been discussion of the three R's and also the new approach methods uh, as shown by some of the data that I presented. Uh, uh, we have to consider alternatives to animal use. And then I think overall, again, as has been uh, mentioned, greater emphasis on the really high degree of uh, regulation of uh, animal-based uh, research. And that's my next slide. Thank you very much. And I think the questions are going to be held to the end. I would add at the end of my PowerPoint, I have uh, several slides with reference materials. This is just the first of several slides, this one pointing to the low clinical translation and need for greater rigor. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So my name is Philippe Beno, and uh, as a uh, way of introduction and you know, I, I don't know what I did to lose my wonderful National Academy's background. Uh, but anyway, so I, I blurred mine. Uh, <laughs> so um, as, as a way of introduction and, uh, and, uh, and particularly clarity and transparency, uh, let me tell you that I started my laboratory animal medicine career in 1978 at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And then I was employed uh, for 31 years in academia in the USA. And then somewhere in the middle of that uh, time span, I also worked uh, 13 years with Pfizer. And at that time, I was based out of France. So I'm now a private consultant. I retired uh, two years ago, but I still have uh, ties with Cornell University as an adjunct professor. 
uh, several uh, departments, including uh, the one on uh, clinical sciences. Uh, I'm a member of the AVMA, uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association's Council on Research, and I'm the vice chair elect of ALAC International's board of directors. But today here I will speak strictly uh, from my personal perspective. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, do so. And I want to particularly thank all the previous speakers. Um, you know, we, we don't uh, exchange uh, presentations. And so it's very nice to see that uh, a lot of what I was going to talk about has already been covered in some way or another and usually better and more in depth than I'm going to do. Uh, but not everything, not quite everything. But anyway, so far, I, I personally have enjoyed uh, the workshop. Next slide, please. So um, I, re I really like the Jim Fox's slide on the uh, back to the future. So I understand we're looking proactively to change, but it's, it's pretty good to look back. And so uh, just like several other um, presenters, uh, there's this part in the eighth edition called preface. You know, and I always thought the preface was the part that not a lot of people looked at, but it is actually extremely important. And so it's been used by several of the uh, other other presenters. And so, um, but, but I, I, I immediately picked up on it when I started to put together my slides and the guide is to assist. And, and you know, <laughs> that's, that's not a light term. Uh, it assists institutions in caring for and using animals, using, that's the research part, in ways judged to be scientifically, technically, and humanely appropriate. The guide is also intended to assist investigators, yet again, in fulfilling their obligation to plan and conduct animal experiments in accord with the highest scientific, humane, and ethical principles. So recommendations in the guide are based on published data, scientific principles, expert opinion, and experience with methods and practices that have proved to be consistent with both high quality research and humane animal care and use. Next slide, please, also has parts of that, that preface. Uh, the guide is an internationally accepted primary reference on animal care and use. And I'd like to stop a little bit on the international part, and that's not because uh, um, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Europe, and and, uh, and, and you know, uh, and I'm a diplomate of the European College. Uh, but I know the the guide started in Chicago many decades ago. The guide has absolutely outgrown uh, any geographical uh, areas. It is it is an excellent document put together by top notch. Of professionals in the field. So it, it also says that its use is required in the United States by the public health service policy. And, you know, I, I wrote then, is this latter point a restriction in further development of the international nature and application of the guide? And, you know, I sure hope not. And so far, it appears not to be the case uh, from what I've heard so far. Uh, on uh, the presentation. Um, and as a matter of fact, listening to the presenters today, I, I get the feeling that there is the guide and then there's the regulatory use of the guide. And that's, that's a different matter. Um, and so, so it, it's difficult. And, and so I, th I think session five of this workshop will deal with uh, global aspects um, of the guide. Uh, but I think it should be, we should continue to treat it as an internationally accepted reference. So uh, add on the Indian College of Lab Animal Medicine as a uh, way to uh, certify uh, attending veterinarians. Uh, the committee, that was the committee to review the guide, version eight, uh, carried forward the balance between ethical and scientific based practice that has always been the basis of the guide and fulfilled its role to provide an updated resource that enables the research community to proceed responsibly and in a self-regulatory manner. 
with animal experimentation. So the guide is predicated on the understanding that the exercise of professional judgment both upholds the central notion of performance standards. You can add, you know, some engineering standards to that, but in the end, you still are going to have to interpret that, and that's performance standards. And it obviates the need for more stringent regulations, and that part is extremely important. Next slide, please. So uh, for me, the eighth edition of the guide was remarkable because it emphasized performance standards. Uh, it was already in the previous version of the guide, but it, but it emphasized them. And it clearly empowered the IACUCs to implement uh, variations on the guide's recommendations, as long as it was, <clears throat> pardon me, based on sound professional uh, judgment. And <clears throat> several other speakers have uh, touched on that matter as well. So um, the care and use of laboratory animals is a complex activity, <clears throat> and it varies many different ways. For example, the work environment. I've worked at universities. I've worked with Pfizer. I've worked as a, a, a consulting attending veterinarian at contract research organizations. That's just one example. Uh, the concerned species, the classic lab animal, the agricultural species, wild animals, that has already been brought up. Uh, Stacy brought up an, another interesting point, which I did not write down here, but I have it as a note here, and that is that the institutional official is also a major factor in the complexity <clears throat> of the animal care and use program. So both as an individual and as a representative of the institution. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing a little more um, on the responsibilities and the, you know, it's, um, it's that famous three-legged stool of the IO, the IACUC and the AV, and you should not underestimate the IO. Uh, from personal experience, uh, I can tell you it can be fantastic, fantastically good, and sometimes frighteningly bad. But anyway, so um, institutional animal care and use committees are a privilege and they're associated with responsibilities, but they provide flexibility and they provide efficiency. And so I think it is essential to maintain these basic principles from this preface to the uh, last edition as a functioning system of oversight and support. Having worked in Europe, I, I can tell you that that is not the case everywhere, and I am a very big fan of IACUS. So um, next slide, please. Now for matters that have been touched upon already, but you know, the page four of the present edition talks about ethics and animal use. And so the decisions to use animals in research requires critical thought, judgment, and analysis. So to the understanding of what constitutes ethical review and considerations, which is another term found on another page, and if that term should be used at all, and is, is often debated, uh, particularly by parties who might not be completely involved as deeply as we are in uh, laboratory animal research. Qualifications of reviewers performing these tasks of uh, ethical review uh, Sometimes it's debated. And, and so for me, the real concern exists that this debate is moving into a realm of impracticality. I think uh, previous speakers have touched on statistics. Um, you know, I don't need a degree of statistics to get an idea of whether things are interpretable in the end. Um, you, you know, when it comes to FDA regulated studies, I, I, I did those at least 13 years with Pfizer. Statistical analysis gets done by a statistician. I understand that, but there's still a way that we can put that information together. So I'm not so sure I need to be a certified uh, uh, bioethicist to have uh, an opinion about the ethics. So maybe this is a large and a complex issue. Maybe we need to have a different uh, workshop about this, um, but it is something that I think uh, we should touch on 
<clears throat> in the guide. And so when it comes to you know having opinions and ethical um, e ethical opinions, look at what invaluable contributions the IACUC non-affiliated members of the public bring to the IACUC. <clears throat> anyway, pardon me. Next slide, please. So a little expansion on that ethics. Uh, the three R's, I think they're well explained in uh, the section on page four of the present guide. Uh, however, a culture of care, as was brought up by Joe Cornegay, it's only addressed on page 34, and it's addressed in the post-approval monitoring section. And you can see right there, just copy the text. Uh, I think that now that most concerned parties are familiar with the three R's concept, the guide should expand a little bit on the less well understood concept of culture of care. Uh, Joe touched on it. I think Stacy talked about what is animal welfare. Again, <clears throat> not an easy thing to do, but the thing that I believe uh, would strengthen the I I'm, I'm sorry, would strengthen the guide further. And then particularly when you start using that uh, guide in, in, in other parts of the world. Next, next slide, kids. So there's one part that is um, a little close uh, to my activities in the last uh, 12 or 14 years or so, and that is translational research and client-owned animals in uh, veterinary clinical studies. So I think translational research is extremely important. Uh, more studies are needed on client-owned animals. They live in an environment that we share with them, and they also present with spontaneous, meaning non-induced diseases. And as, as previous speakers said, you know, um, they're not laboratory animals. So I think this type of research is not a guide matter because they're not laboratory animals, uh, but it, it becomes one when the US governmental funds are involved and then presently an ICUC review is required. And so, next slide, please. Section four will deal with veterinary clinical studies in the consent form, and I put informed between parentheses because uh, the AVMA has uh, <clears throat> some opinions about the term informed, or their lawyers do, let's put it that way. I would like for you all to note that a team of present and past members of the AVMA's Council on Research updated the AVMA's policy on veterinary clinical studies committees, VCSCs, and we published on the functions of these committees. We also structured these committees to parallel the concept and the function of IAC. But we want to point out that the guide and the Animal Welfare Act and regulations do not contain information to assist VCSCs for the creation of consent documents. Now, some of some laboratory animal veterinarians are already involved in these important studies, and we should all be aware of them. However, the guide deals with laboratory animals and their keeping, particularly their keeping, and not with the exercise of veterinary clinical activities on client-owned animals. So um, although I, I saw um, uh, the, the, the survey whereby a lot of people said the guy should um, uh, get involved in that, let me just tell you that now we're going to be dealing with the exercise of our veterinary profession on client-owned animals. And that is the purview the way we are structured in the U.S. now, that is the purview hey, of, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You've got about a minute and a half to go. Absolutely. We're just about done. So we, we, we have these uh, state veterinary medical associations, and they, they, they're the ones involved in this. So the advice that I have is, in the meantime, governmental entities should review the burden of evaluating veterinary clinical studies uh, presently placed on these on our IACUCs as they are <clears throat> currently constituted. Next, and I believe uh, la last slide. <clears throat> last uh, little um, is more uh, will be handled in section seven and eight, and it's how to uh, bring in 
uh, information. Um, maybe a suggestion is to um, have uh, IACUC, IACUC members remain uh, current, a little bit of a continuing education requirement in which that task should clearly lay with IACUC staff, which uh, as uh, Stacy mentioned, are CPIAs. Um, and, uh, and in there, I think uh, making sure that uh, that we come up with a doable system because the burden on ICOX is already pretty intense. There you go. Thank you so much for all your time. Um, that's my, well, there's one more slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to the workshop committee for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Monica Burns, and I'm going to provide some feedback on uh, how industry uses the guide from an industry stakeholder perspective. Um, so we can go ahead and advance the slide. And just one quick note that all views discussed during this presentation are my own opinion and opinions and do not reflect the views of my employer. So now we can go to the next slide, please. How does industry use the guide? Um, today we'll cover a few topics as to in general how industry programs use the guide. Um, we'll talk about how it is used for internal programs how it is used for outsourced or uh, programs conducted at third party sites, some risks of not updating the guide, some industry stakeholder feedback on the guide, and specifically as it relates to suggestions for future editions of the guide. And then I'll share some conclusions from um, all of this feedback overall. So we can go to the next slide. I think one main takeaway I'd like to convey for today is that the guide is used as a critical guidance document for both internal programs in industry and external programs. And so I'll define those a little bit further. Internal programs are programs that are maintained by the company itself, um, where the company has direct oversight of those programs. They are located within company facilities. Everything about it is controlled by the company. External programs would involve programs and in vivo studies that are outsourced to third parties. So that could be typically a contract research organization or perhaps um, via an academic collaboration at a university site. So that those would all fall under um, the CROs and the academic collaborations would fall under this category of external. So these are programs where the company itself does not have that direct oversight and direct control of, of the, the in vivo program. It is an indirect control of the program. Uh, many industry organizations also have multiple sites that belong to the same company or kind of are part of the same company. And it is not uncommon for some of those sites to be within the US and then some perhaps to be outside of the US. So there is a geographic diversity to that internal animal care and use program, um, even just looking at the internal program itself. And ALAC accreditation is typically used as a mechanism to ensure that um, high standards are consistently applied even across geographies. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. For internal program applications, internal site IACUCs will use the guide as a guidance document in the following situations. So if they are ALAC accredited, if they have a PHS assurance, and or if they are located in a geography with a regulatory requirement to follow the guide. So an example of such a geography would be Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it is a citywide requirement um, to, you, to follow the guide for all animal care and use programs. Uh, internal program application and actual implementation use of the guide on a day-to-day -day basis, if you are coming from an academic background, would look familiar in industry that actual um, for internal industry programs, that actual, actual uh, implementation is very similar. Okay, and we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
For outsource program applications, the guide would apply to in vivo work done at a third party, outsourced by an industry company, if the external partner site is ALAC accredited and or if it has a PHS assurance. So kind of no matter the geography. Next slide, please. The guide is also used for outsource programs when preparing facility assessment questionnaires for animal welfare audits or risk assessments. So it is common practice to do this type of risk assessment or audit of any third party animal engagements. And if you looked at a typical questionnaire for that purpose, you would see a lot of um, kind of hearkening back to the topics that are covered in the guide. The guide is also used as a reference um, or resource when conducting physical site vis visits and or animal welfare audits themselves. So again, really typical to focus um, a lot on the topics, the main, the main points, the main topics in the guide and kind of have those in mind when doing a physical site visit or an animal welfare audit in person of a facility and program. Next slide, please. Now I'll present some feedback from two industry consortia on focus areas for updates to the guide. So these consortia contained representatives from a number of different industry companies, and this was kind of collective feedback gathered. Uh, the guide should provide evidence-based guidance. Peer-reviewed literature should provide science-based updates to the guide, especially for updates to um, housing parameters, enrichment, and behavioral program requirements. Instead of should statements, the guide should use may uh, to provide more flexibility and pair that with the expectation that the facility and program itself will provide data to justify their chosen practices. The expectations for harm benefit analysis and experimental design should be harmonized between ALAC and the guide. The guide should emphasize the value of the three R's, compassion, resiliency, and a culture of care program to strengthen animal programs. And this has come up in a, in a few presentations today. The guide should not list specifics for this type of program, for a culture of care program, but should allow organizations to define their own program. The guide should address animal reduct the topic of animal reduction by implementing good scientific and statistical practices itself. Next slide, please. So some additional feedback from these two industry consortia. Um, conflicts of interest can arise if the PI and the attending veterinarian are the same person. This can have potential implications for the research aims and for animal welfare overall. The guide should provide clarity around the role of the attending veterinarian. There's additional uh, need for guidance on rehoming and retirement of animals, um, using published literature to ground guidance on basic considerations for adoption programs would be very beneficial in the next edition, including and especially for those institutions with limited resources. There should be evidence-based recommendations for acceptable environmental humidity, especially when there is minimal impact to, in situations where there's minimal impact or expected impact to animals. And there should also be evidence-based recommendations for social housing for animals, especially those individuals that have unsocial behavior. Next slide, please. Now I'll talk about some um, general risks of not updating the guide kind of from, from an industry perspective. There's a risk that new guidance documents or agreements, so for example, the recently published Marseille Declaration will continue to be generated to fill gaps in guide standards or perceived gaps in guide standards if the guide is not updated with current evidence-based animal welfare advancements. So for example, the opportunity, having the opportunity for vertical flight for non-human primates. This type of advancement, so vertical flight for non-human primates, for example, are recognized as standard of care in many geographies and by many um, international organizations. So again, if in the absence of any harmonized guidance documents reflecting those new advancements that are kind of spread internationally, there really is a risk that even more additional guidance, new guidance documents will continue to fill the gap. If we have all of these new guidances that kind of have different areas where they apply or not, this will result in a greater diversity of guidelines for programs to follow and that will likely cause some increased administrative burden for programs, which um, ultimately would be beneficial for everyone to avoid. 
And we'll go to the next slide, please. So this is my final slide. I have some conclusions, some general takeaways. The guide is a critical guidance document for industry. The guide standards are applied to internal company programs where there is direct oversight and direct control by the company of the animal care and use program. And then also to outsourced programs that are conducted at third party sites where there is indirect um, oversight, indirect control of the uh, in vivo studies that are sponsored by individual companies. The guide is used by industry when conducting animal welfare audits in a, in a variety of different capacities. Industry stakeholders have some feedback on the use of the guide and some recommendations for um, topics to include for the next edition and for areas um, that should be expanded or updated. And there are some risks with not updating the guide or not updating it in a way that is responsive to all of this feedback. So with that, I will wrap up for today and thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you so much, Monica. We will hold questions until the end. And if we could have Deb up next, and then we will follow with questions when she has completed her presentation. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, my name is Deb Hickman, and I am the Global Director for ALAC International. I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian by training, and I'm delighted to be with you all today um, to talk about how ALAC International uses the guide. Uh, next slide, please. So the two topics that I'm going to cover today are um, a little bit of the detail about the relationship of our organization and the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Um, and then I want to walk us through how we implemented the uh, revisions to the 2011 guide to illustrate how we approach the evaluation of any of our standards and help give you some additional feedback about how we use the guide. Next slide. So we're going to start by talking about how ALAC International um, uses the guide. Next slide. So to remind everybody, uh, ALAC International is not a regulatory agency. We are a voluntary accreditation organization. Uh, we trace our history back to the animal care panel in the 1950s, the group that was also the authors of the first guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Um, it's important to recognize that one of the reasons why ALAC International came into being was because the founders of the Animal Care Panel recognized that there should be a separation between those who are writing the standards and those who are establishing whether units are following the standards. And that history goes back almost 60 years for us. Um, we will be celebrating 60 years next year, um, and we have currently over 1,000 accredited units in 50 countries across the globe. Next slide. ALAC has always been dedicated to ensuring the welfare of animals, um, but we have been officially an international accreditation unit since the 1980s. And for over 30 years, we've been a leader in harmonizing the performance standards for animal care and use programs across the globe um, because of our, our work accrediting units in multiple countries. Next slide. I think you can appreciate the importance that the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals has for our organization when you look at our rules for accreditation. Um, in the section two of our standards, we very, very clearly state the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals shall serve as a basic guide for the establishment of specific standards for accreditation. Next slide. So how do we implement this? Um, so this slide shows an overview of the accreditation process, and the part that I'd like to highlight where the guide has a, has a piece, you can advance one, please, is the program description self-evaluation part of the accreditation process. So when a unit is deciding that they want to be accredited or ready for their revisit, uh, they are asked to perform a self-evaluation where they complete a program description. This program description framework is heavily follows the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. And the council will then take that self-evaluation and look to see what the institution is doing. And then they'll compare it to the standards of the guide and determine whether the unit is, in, is, is following the expectations that ALIC International has 
um, for the accreditation process for the expectations that are in the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Can you advance one again? Uh, one thing I do want to make sure that we mention here, though, is that in the ALAC vernacular, uh, we are very reliant on the shoulds and the musts as we are doing our accreditation evaluations. Um, our equivalent of the shoulds are suggestions for improvement. So if a unit that is being evaluated is not doing something that is considered a should in the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, for example, um, our accreditation body would recommend that they consider this as a suggestion for improvement. Um, on the other hand, our other finding are the mandatory items, and those items are the musts in the guide. So if there is a must in the guide and an accredited unit or a, or a unit that would like to be accredited are not doing um, one of the musts, then that does become a mandatory item for them. Next slide. So now I'd like to give us a high level overview of how we implemented the 2011 guide. Um, just to illustrate again how our organization uses the guide and how we make it apply in a multinational situation. Um, we don't accept things at face value. The council does a very detailed assessment of the information that is in front of us and they are um, often provide clarifying comments to help the council and the units understand our expectations as needed. And this process is definitely an ongoing process for us. Next slide. So in 2011, um, we received a copy of the pre-publication copy of the guide, the revised guide, and the council began a detailed look at all of the changes in the revised version. Um, this included some retreats where we did a lot of detail analysis, line by line, very focused detail analysis of the, the differences between the 1996 guide and the 2011 guide. Um, four subcommittees were formed, each one worked at each chapter. Uh, the Looking back at the notes for that day, um, the review was intensive and one, with the note that one section did not even finish until nearly 11 p.m. on the first day of their retreat with the amount of changes and the amount of discussion that happened with this. Next slide. In addition to the differences between the two documents, Council also had many other documents that they were using to aid in this analysis and comparison. Uh, this included feedback from our Board of Trustee member organizations and other scientific organizations, um, the feedback that, that was solicited from our stakeholders, and each chapter's committees considered the stakeholders' comments as they conducted their analysis. Next slide. For each and every topic that the council discussed, they had five specific questions that they evaluated. The first one was, how does this issue compare with the European guidance and the Ag guide or not? Uh, the second question was, what is council's interpretation of the issue or statement? The third question was, how does what does the council expect from units in order to be able to comply with this issue or statement? The fourth was, how will this issue be evaluated on site visits and by the council? And then the fifth was, will this issue require revision or addition to our internal processes um, that are used to help the council with their accreditation process evaluation? Next slide. At the end of our retreats, uh, the council met as one body to review the significant changes of each chapter committee. Uh, these changes were discussed and a unified consensus was developed. Um, again, the notes say that to say that discussion was lively and intense would be an understatement, but this was a laborious but very highly productive process for our groups. Because there were so many points in the new guide that required consideration, uh, Council had to have additional meetings to have more discussion of the significant issues, and there was a lot of follow-up um, to determine what kind of written clarification might be needed from the Council, either through our position statements or FAQs. Next slide. At the end of the evaluation process, the council decided that they would adopt the ILAR guide um, and conclude it with the Ag guide and ETS 123 as the three primary standards of accreditation used by our organization. This led to a minor revision of our rules of accreditation at this time, and it led to some changes in the program description outline to make sure that the program description was collecting the information that uh, the council had determined was necessary after the revision of the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Next slide. <clears throat> 
At the end of the day, Council had identified 121 topics in the 2011 ILAR guide that needed to have additional attention in our program description and in our education and training and education and outreach um, efforts. So we started working on this back in 2011 with a priority order of which topics we thought were the most important. And since 2011, uh, the council has worked tirelessly to make sure that our units are aware of uh, our expectations through the use of, again, things like position statements, FAQs, and our library of reference resources. Next slide. So ALAC International relies on the three primary standards used by the council to evaluate programs. But as I said earlier, we do not necessarily accept all of these standards at face value. So it is important to recognize that we do have additional information on our website that is of, of use to people who are seeking to be accredited. And it's very int of interest to people who are understanding how we have implemented the guide and what our relationship is with the guide. Um, so the first category that I'm going to talk about are the position statements. And these position statements are statements that have been developed by the Council on Accreditation to help us in the evaluation and accreditation of animal care and use programs. Next slide. So you can see our list of position statements is relatively short. Um, from our history, from our roots, we have tried again, not to be the people who are writing the standards, but to be the people, the organization that is evaluating how our accredited units are applying the standards. Um, there are occasional, uh, occasional um, times when this has not necessarily been followed. I think the best example on this slide is our rack washer safety. This position statement was drafted by the council because there was not information available that addressed this, incre this incredibly important safety issue. So council developed their own um, position statement to help guide our accredited units on our expectations when using this large piece of equipment. Um, these position statements are under continuous review and improvement. Uh, for example, the role of the attending veterinarian and veterinary care position statement is currently under revision, and we will be releasing it for comment from our stakeholders in the coming month. Next slide. In, addi in addition to the position statements, the Council on Accreditation developed a series of FAQs. These are much shorter documents that are uh, that are present there to help the accredited units and to help the council members understand issues that might need a little bit of clarification from our primary standards, um, including the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Next slide. These slides are gonna show the incredibly long list of FAQs that we have. Um, I'm listing them here for information only and just to highlight a few examples, but this list has grown extensively since 2011, especially as since many of the previous speakers have, have pointed out, um, we've had to clarify and update expectations because the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals is no longer necessarily providing the information that is appropriate. Um, for example, you can see things, we've added language on things like invertebrate animals, post-approval monitoring, uh, non-pharmaceutical drug compounds, non-pharmaceutical grade uh, drug compounds. Next slide. Um, we provided some additional information on our clarifications on the expectations for trio breeding and social housing, um, in addition to those implemented in the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Uh, we also have some topics that are specific to the use of uh, agricultural animals and the euthanasia of animals. And our next slide. And you can see on this slide, we start to have physical plan expectations in addition to information about uh, the accreditation process and the organization itself. And the last slide of FAQs, if you can advance. Um, we have more information on the general administrative per, uh, general administrative operations of ALAC, uh, but also it, this includes a very important new topic for us. Um, not new for us, we've expected it, but just new topic and getting in having people report um, our expectations around adverse event reporting requirements. Um, there's two FAQs on adverse event reporting uh, that have been recently released by the organization. Next slide. So since 1975, ALAC International has also referred to other specialty publications for supplemental information about procedures or techniques related to the care and use of laboratory animals. These specialty publications are designated as reference resources. And again, you can find these on our website. 
Next slide. So this slide has an example of some reference resources. Um, in general, the references listed on the included on this list have been formally reviewed and adopted by ALAC International's Council on Accreditation, and they're presented as guidance for accredited units as well as our Council on Accreditation um, and their representatives during the site visit. Uh, these references can also be used by Council during deliberations when we're discussing issues that are identified during the site visits. Um, we acknowledge that the, although these references help fulfill important knowledge gaps in the existing, uh, like in this case, uh, aquatic animal facility and zebrafish literature, we recognize that there may, may be limits on the ability of sites to be able to adopt the recommended practices just because um, they may not have the current availability to be able to screen or to take care of some of the recommendations that are in, in these documents in general. So we are very, very proud um, of these documents. We think that they are definitely worth being having attention paid to them. One of the things that's very uh, interesting to our organization about these two reference resources in particular is that they represent a truly international approach to coming up with some new, new expectations for how to handle aquatic species um, with the partnership between Philosa and ALAS uh, generating these two overview articles with their recommendations. And for our operations, as new re reference resources become available, uh, we do update these recommendations periodically. So it is worth looking at our webpage um, on a regular basis. The other thing that I'd like to point out too is on the slide, uh, you can see that there's a box that says C note from council at the beginning of each reference. Uh, when applicable, the council will put clarifying notes appended to the reference, which provide you with additional information on any clarifications that they think need to be applied to the reference. So it's worth looking at the documents at our website to make sure that you're seeing the most, um, the most applicable and understanding exactly what council is looking for in those reference resources. Um, next slide is my questions and discussion slide. Um, so we can go to the next one, but thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you to all the panel members on this. I do have a couple of questions to address, I think, to each of you. So I'm going to start with the first one. So this, um, and I I'll call each of you out for, for responses, but the question reads, within the context of the perspectives discussed in this session, our IACUC, our um, in investigator, the academia, industry, and ALAC, where does the ethical review of animal studies currently occur, at least within your, your own institutions? And, and Deb, perhaps you can speak to what ALAC would expect. If it's outside of your institution, do you think that the review body would characterize themselves as an ethical review body. So let me see. Let's go ahead and go back in the same order that everybody spoke. So Stacy, do you have um, So, oh yes. For most um, academic institutions, the idea is that the funding agency would be reviewing for scientific merit. Um, that may or may not also include an, an ethical review, depending on the funding agency. And um, scientific merit would also take into account other aspects of the other aspects of um, whether or not the work should be done beyond ethics. So from that perspective, um, there's not an ethical review per se in those words done by the funding agencies. Of course, funding agencies are all different. There are some institutions that apply some ethical concepts within their IACUC review. Um, whether or not that constitutes a full ethical review um, can be debated. And generally IACUCs within the United States are not known as, as ethics boards or ethics committees. That terminology is generally used outside of the United States in, in Europe. So that's not a definitive answer, but it gives some, some context around what was being asked. Fantastic, thank you. Joe, what would your perspective be? So I'm not speaking for any particular uh, organization. I'm certainly not speaking for the academy nor for industry, I'm not speaking for ALAC. Uh, 
Um, I suppose I would be speaking as an individual researcher, and in particular, one who used a, a canine model of Duchenne dystrophy for many years. And as you might imagine, um, being a canine model quite visible and open to criticism and open to a question on ethics. Uh, as Stacy indicated, certainly within iCook, you get a level of uh, ethical review. An example would be, in my own experience, I had a very clear criteria that would warrant euthanasia of dogs, dogs that were no longer ambulatory, nor could they achieve sternal recumbency, dogs that had a, a certain percent of weight loss over a, a dictated period of time. Uh, those would be clear indications uh, for euthanasia. So in my experience overall, uh, the ethical review would be mostly through the iCook. But obviously, through the USDA, uh, through OLA, uh, we had periodic inspections by both of those regulatory agencies. Uh, the ethical use of the animals would, would typically be a consideration. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Philippe, what are your thoughts from an academic perspective? To the academic perspective, uh, but uh, yes. Um, you know, when you go back and you look at uh, the way it's written right now, the, the uh, harm um, benefit, you know, the, 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 which, which I, I prefer to call cost benefit analysis, that's, that's one way to start. As I said before, the, the, the term ethics, uh, and then, you know, you automatically get bioethicists who say, no, 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 that's our domain. Uh, well, I, I understand that, but um, the way we're constituted, and I think veterinarians get enough, um, well, maybe not enough, but they get certainly um, information on ethics when they're in, in vet school. Uh, that certainly was the case in the last 10 years I've spent at Cornell. So it, it's, it is nice to see that. Uh, and I don't think we need to be particularly um, uh, schooled in that in general. But I think it'd be nice if the guy could talk a little bit more about that. Because just like Stacy said, it's just one of those terms like animal welfare that is the same way. It, it's not easy to define. And it is very useful to define. And then particularly if we're going to go talk about a um, culture of care. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Philippe. Monica, what are your thoughts from industry standpoint? Um, sure. So I'll be, I'll be very clear again. These are my own personal opinions, not those of my company or other industry companies. So I think there are, there, given the somewhat vast geographic footprint that many industry members have. I think there are a lot of different ways that this is addressed. Um, I think that ethical review is done, yeah, it's done in a variety of different ways, depending on where you are, the particular program, the particular IACUC, particular ethical review body. Personally, I think that it should be done at kind of a higher level so that as projects are conceptualized, as strategies are formulated, ethical review is incorporated into that. Um, I think in an ideal world, it would be great if then the eth ethical review bodies and or IACUCs could uh, be empowered to do kind of an additional component of ethical review as well. Um, there are, again, currently ethical review bodies across industry, I know, that, that are looking at these topics. Um, but it would be really helpful if the guide addressed this in a more straightforward manner. Um, three R's, looking for or kind of evaluating how three R's are implemented and addressed. I think that is done uh, well by by IACUCs and ethical review bodies, but that's not the same as, um, you know, a, a really robust and concrete ethical review of the work, proposed work itself. So I'll leave it there. Terrific. Thanks so much. Deb, we've got one minute left in this session. Do you want to give us your thoughts? Well, I, I can be pretty quick because I'm going to echo that what was, what's been said by the others. It's just like welfare ethics is, is a much more complicated topic than we can probably delve into here. 
Um, but I would point from ALOC's perspective, we do have an FAQ on scientific reproducibility, which does provide some information about what our expectations are um, in that area of, of review. Fantastic. Well, I would like to once again thank all of you, our panelists, in this session on the use of the guide. Uh, we will now be taking another 10-minute break and hope to see everybody back at 3.35 uh, Eastern Standard Time. So thank you again, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>